Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Choice of Entity Considerations After the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm happy to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams, Jim Dubeck, National Tax Director, Partnerships, and Gunnar Haugen, Senior Manager, Tax. And Jim, I will now turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Emily. Um, good morning. And today we're just going to kind of go through what could be a potentially difficult question to address, and as to whether you are in the ideal choice, ideal entity from a tax perspective. And we're going to also primarily focus on tax issues, but also look at not a couple of things, non-tax issues that should be addressed. And Specifically, we're focused on the recent Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was passed late last year and uh, the considerations with changes in tax rates and changes in certain types of deductions that can significantly impact these entities, specifically you know, on new Section 199 Cap A, which is a 20% deduction for certain pass-through entities, S-Corps, partnerships, sole proprietorships, uh, limitations on state and local tax deductions, specifically at individual levels, um, and a new, what they call, excess business loss limitation, which caps the amount of losses that can be used primarily to individuals to offset other sources of income from a, that are non-business related, such as wages, uh, portfolio income, basically limited to 250 for single taxpayers and half a million for married filing joint. Another significant change in the landscape is the limitation on uh, business interest expense, um, basically limited to 30% of a certain adjusted business income. We're going to briefly touch on Section 1061, which deals with a somewhat limited uh, extension of the long-term capital gain period from one year to three years for certain qualified partnership interests that are um, primarily held by hedge funds and uh, private equity funds. Talk about international changes and some special rules on escort conversions, generally favorable, and go through several modeling examples. I think one of the things that we would like 
as a takeaway from this presentation is to say everything needs to be modeled and uh, to give the economic, get an understanding of post-tax economics, but also consider non-tax issues as well. So what we'd like to do is just kind of find out if your company is currently organized as a pass-through entity, such as an S-Corp or partnership, are you considering converting to a C-Corp? Given the changes, primarily the reduction in tax rate to a flat 21%. We'd like to see what the thought process is out there or if there's immediate considerations. We've get, gotten quite a few questions. The first questions that came up shortly after the enactment by a lot of our clients were, should I incorporate? We'll go ahead here and see what kind of answers come up, either yes or no. So here's what we got. And basically about 30, 45, with 24 basically saying they haven't even considered it or don't really know whether they have, <clears throat> or have addressed this. Hopefully this seminar will give you a couple, a kind of a conceptual framework to approach this and question if necessary, and or the tools that are a starting point to um, begin the decision-making process. So, as we mentioned earlier, really the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act really did change the game in a lot of ways in determining whether you should be a flow through entity or a C-Corp. One of the biggest changes, obviously, was a reduction from 35% to a 21% flat tax rate for C-Corps. Um, also applies to professional service corps. There's no graduated rates. Repeal the AMT for corporations. For flow through entities to kind of give an equivalent after tax effect, certain entities, qualifying trades or businesses, are subject to a 20% deduction. Um, there's also some limitations of state and local deductions, tax deductions, excess. And there's also, like we mentioned earlier, the excess business loss. And another very big item that can be quite important in tax planning is the expensing of qualified property. There's a limited time frame as indicated in here, but clearly it could be quite significant, which also will play into um, decisions of whether and when to make large property acquisitions certain tax years. There's also the new section 1061 on uh, long-term capital gain holding period extension from one year to three year for certain partnership interests of certain assets held primarily by hedge funds and private equity. <clears throat> and changes to non-corporate tax brackets with the maximum rate coming down from 39.6 to 37 and much more favorable brackets below that maximum rate application and some significant changes to the U.S. international tax rules, which we'll summarize later. So really, I to be considering our ability to take advantage of 199A deduction. Uh, some entities will, some won't, depending on their situation. Uh, there's getting a 20% deduction could be quite significant if applicable. It may be somewhat limited. Also fixed assets that are, that are depreciable are a significant factor in determining that. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, deferring C-level corporate tax might be cr critical. And really the, cor the C corporation deferral is primarily should you take the dividends, could you flush most of the income out with one level of tax via salary. So these are all factors that need to be done. How long is your investment horizon? Um, <clears throat> Possible considerations would be um, if you anticipate 1202 stock exemption or potentially uh, the death of the shareholder may uh, get a 1014 step up the basis to the C Corp stock of that individual may be beneficial for long-term planning and a liquidation scenario. Um, 
other items, type of income, whether it's capital appreciation or ordinary income, you anticipate off of your investment. Tax brackets could also be considerate. Considerations are still there for individuals. Self-employment net investment income needs to be factored into that. Our examples later on will show how that can be quite significant in determining post-tax results. Tax tree or reinvested earnings and state tax deductions, as well as international provisions, if applicable. So one of the things we really want to do is kind of look at it from a holistic standpoint. Does this? We can't just look at it from a tax perspective. And if you're considering moving to the C corp environment, there's different ways that it can be done. How do you want to incorporate in the partnership world? There's three basic ways um, that you can incorporate, and each one of them should be addressed because they can give you different results. Um, other considerations that you probably should factor in are non-income tax considerations. Are you giving up flexibility, moving out of something such as a partnership where you can do special allocations, you can issue profits, interests, or do you want to move in a C-Corp environment where, for example, you can issue options in, on a little easier basis? and other items, of the incentive items that certain people understand. The idea, one thing you should mention is it's very hard to get out of the C-Corp structure. Once you're there, you can't simply liquidate without incurring a corporate level tax. On that, I'll turn it over to Gunnar, Section 199A. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, as Jim mentioned, uh, when we were thinking about choice of entity in this in this new environment that we're operating in, uh, one of the material considerations, if not the material consideration that the businesses are going to have to to think about, is their ability to qualify for this new 20% deduction under Section 199A. And Section 199A, what it does is basically gives a 20% deduction on qualified business income to non-corporate taxpayers. So what does that mean? It means taxpayers that are individuals, for instance, that are receiving uh, business income for partnerships or shareholders, and S-corporations that are receiving income from, uh, from those corporations, from those S-corporations. It also applies to people operating in a sole proprietorship type environment or a single-member disregarded LLC type of environment anybody who is a non-corporate taxpayer. It does not, it is not limited just to pass-through entities in the partnership or S-corporation sense. But the ability to qualify for this, if you can, the effect is that it reduces what, at least at the top uh, individual rates, would be a 37% effective tax rate down to about a 29%, 29.6% effective tax rate on this qualified business income. And that creates at least some sort of rough parity between these individual tax rates, at least on this, this qualified business income, and the 21% rate that is applied in the C-corporation environment once you factor in the shareholder level tax for, for uh, C-corporations. So it's very, very important to understand how you can qualify for Section 199A. And uh, someone for the provision is quite complex, and there's a number of hoops to jump through to understand if your business qualifies. And this slide attempts to give you sort of a framework for thinking about the different things that you need to consider in determining how much or if your income can qualify for this deduction. So starting on the left-hand side of this page, the first thing that you need to think about is whether your business is a qualified business. And a qualified business, the first thing that it must be is it must be a trader business, which is kind of a term of art for tax purposes. And that, that just means something that needs to be you know regularly and continuously um, engaged in by the taxpayer to make some to make some income, right? It's not a passive type of investment activity. It is a trader business. Probably the question we get here, going to get here most is rental properties. And you know, as long as some sort of active management is taking place, I expect uh, oftentimes we'll qualify those rental properties as as trades or businesses. Um, if it's a very passive type of triple net lease, things might become a little bit more squishy. But in any case, you need to qualify as a trader business in the first instance. There are then two kind of exclusions you need to think about. The first is for 
specified service trades or businesses, which cannot be qualified businesses. We'll get into that in a minute on a further slide. And the second is that performance of services as an employee does not count as a qualified business. So my employment with Moss Adams does not qualify me as being in a qualified business. Once I have a qualified business, the second step is to determine the qualified business income of that business. And that is generally the business income attributable to the business, um, but it excludes certain things that you gotta keep in mind. And the first of which is it does not include any income that is not effectively connected with the US, with the United States. So if you have international operations, that income from that operation cannot qualify for this uh, deduction. The second is that it doesn't include, as you might expect, investment type of items, uh, such as dividends, capital gains, etc. It also does not include compensation paid from that very same business. So if an owner receives wages from um, a pass-through entity, uh, those wages don't qualify as qualified business income and reduce the, the business income in the pass-through entity that can so qualify. So um, to the extent you can otherwise manage these W-2 and property limitations, it might make sense to reduce um, owner compensation uh, to increase the qualified business income produced uh, by the pass-through entity. After you've got your qualified business income, your general deduction is 20% of that amount subject to two limitations. Uh, the, first, it, the first limitation is the greater of 50% of W-2 wages or 25% of W-2 wages and 2.5% of qualified property. And we'll talk a little bit more later about what that means. Then once I run it through that limitation, I also have a second limitation that applies First, the deduction cannot exceed 20% of my taxable income after I've factored out my net capital gain. So those are kind of all the elements you need to think about when, when you're applying Section 199A. The biggest unknown probably in all of those is what does it mean to be in a specified service trader business. On this slide, we've kind of given you the, the general uh, definition that includes most things you would think about. You know, my, my accountant, my doctors, my lawyers out there are all going to be in specified um, service businesses, but the unusual part of this provision is the underlying portion of this slide in which specified service trader business includes any trader business where the principal asset is the skill or reputation of the business's employees or owners. And the scope of that is kind of a head scratcher because that might be, might include, if depending on how the treasury wants to interpret it, things that are not what we generally think of as services, such as, you know, a situation where there is kind of an entrepreneurial type who's, who's you know, our major asset is his skill at business development. Is, is that uh, now a specified service trader business? Probably shouldn't be in most cases if I'm selling widgets, but nonetheless, it's an unclear point. So something we'll have to keep our eye on um, if we get guidance in this area on what should be a specified service trader business. Importantly, I don't have to worry about the specified service trader business if I'm a relatively small taxpayer. And in particular, for married filing joint um, taxpayers, if my taxable income is less than 315000 I can be in a specified service trader business and still apply the 199A deduction to my income from the business. Um, that, that benefit is, is phased out, if you will, over the next $100,000 that the taxpayer earns, at least a married filing joint case, over the $315,000 limitation. A similar favorable rule applies for small taxpayers with respect to the W-2 and property limitation. Those limitations will not apply to you if, and again, in a married filing joint case, um, the taxpayer earns uh, less than $315,000. And again, those, those limitations or that benefit of that rule is kind of phased out or phased in, depending on how you want to look at it, um, over the next $100,000 of taxable income in the married filing joint case. Although if I'm a small taxpayer, I don't have to apply uh, these W-2 wages and qualified property rules, my other taxpayers will have to be concerned about this. And so it's important to understand what these kind of defined terms of W-2 wages and qualified property means. And W-2 wages is basically your, your U.S. withholdable wages and uh, plus certain items of deferred compensation. So what that does not include is things like guaranteed payments to partners, um, another situation where a W-2 wage that might be difficult to pay it is in a sole proprietorship context where you can't really pay a W-2 wage, at least to the owner of the company. So you've got to kind of think through, can I actually pay a W-2 wage in the context in which my business is operated? The other thing that gets factored into that potential limitation is 2.5% of my qualified property, 
and qualified property is generally tangible property that can be depreciated, so it doesn't include intangibles or land that can't be depreciated. And it's property that's used in the qualified business. And I can count the qualified property or count the property as qualified property over its depreciable period, which is basically the later of 10 years or its otherwise depreciable life under the general um, tax depreciation rules. So that kind of gives you a flavor of all the different things you kind of got to think about high level from a Section 199A perspective to qualify. And again, when you're doing your modeling, this will probably be the, one of the key things to think about. Um, and just a couple of other items to note on this is that although this 20% deduction is very favorable for taxpayers in the traditional income tax, it does not apply with respect to self-employment taxes or that net investment income tax that Jim mentioned earlier. It is also subject to being sunset for taxable years beginning after 12-31-2025. Uh, I think the expectation of everyone who enacted this law is that it will be extended, but nonetheless could create some uncertainty there. So we'll move into our second poll question, and this is uh, Partner A is a, is a partner in partnership, and Partner A receives a salary from partnership that is treated as a guaranteed payment uh, for U.S. tax purposes. Can the guaranteed payment be counted toward the W-2 limitation under Section 199A? And so again, this gets at all things compensation are not necessarily W-2 limitate are not necessarily to not necessarily satisfying the definition of W-2 limitations, and so you're going to have to think about um, whether you can do things to recharacterize that compensation to bring you within this W-2 bucket of uh, of, of compensation. So if we take a look at the poll results. Uh, no, 60, 65%, and that's right, the, the guaranteed payment, since it's not a W-2 wage, is not uh, taken into account with respect to the limitation. So we'll just mention a couple of things on the SALT deduction. This has obviously gotten a lot of, 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 of play in the press, and the only thing to mention here is that although individuals cannot deduct subject to this limitation, generally they're state and local income taxes any longer, subject to this $10,000 limitations. Corporations are not, C corporations are not subject to that same limitation. So when you go to model this, this decision out, you want to take into account the fact that C corporations are not subject to that same SALT deduction limitation. The other thing to consider when you're modeling these things out is that although the C corporation itself is not subject to the SALT deduction limitation, when that C corporation pays a dividend, to its shareholders, or that shareholder sells the C corporation stock and recognizes gain, that shareholder will, in many cases, incur a state-level tax on that income. That income tax, that in state income tax, will be subject to this 164 SALT limitation. And so, although the C corporation is not the second-level shareholder tax, if that's subject to state taxes, that will become subject um, to the potential limitation. And so with that, I'll hand it back to Jim for a discussion on the excess business loss rule. Thanks, Gunnar. Based on uh, one of the more significant items that came up here that impacts primarily individuals is this excess business loss rule. And really what this is was to prevent the use of the large trade or business losses from offsetting other sources of income such as portfolio income, wage income, and um, other items that are earned by taxpayers. And it's limited to basically 250 for most taxpayers and that are single and 500,000 for joint filers. And what happens to these losses? If you have an excess amount, for example, let's say the situation is that you have $600,000 of loss coming through in aggregate. It's looked at as a net aggregate rule from all your trades or businesses. And the first 500, you can use to offset other sources of income if you have them. Otherwise, they get converted into an NOL. NOLs are generally less favorable under the new tax rule. Section 172 has been modified to allow you to only utilize, on a carry-forward basis only, 80% of any NOL carry-forward offset tax will come in future years. Therefore, it's any year that it is anticipated the excess business loss rule may be taking in a careful look at taxpayers' overall tax situation and what is generating these excess business losses should be done. It's 
one of the ideas possibly that may be kicking into an NOL, for example, is the immediate expensing of uh, depreciable equipment that be deferred to a future year when there is anticipated to be more income from the trader businesses. Um, other items that may be possible to do is to defer certain other types of deductions or accelerate income if necessary to avoid losses from getting converted into NOLs. Another thing to keep in mind is, for example, if you have a situation where you do, in one year, have an excess business loss and you do immediate expensing, well, guess what? You're not going to be able to use immediate expensing even in a future year because you're limited to 80% utilization of an NOL, whereas maybe if you defer the the acquisition of those assets or place and service date of those assets to a future year, you may be able to use them 100% provided there's sufficient income. So on that, we have our next polling question. What is the primary disadvantage of the rule that requires taxpayers to carry over losses limited by an excess business loss rule as a net operating loss, essentially under the new NOL rules of 170, Section 172. <clears throat> so Basically, it looks like uh, our listeners are listening carefully, and the correct answer is question number two, the net operating loss deduction, which is limited to 80% of future tax years taxable income, is clearly the reason why. And clearly, when we're looking at making decisions as to whether we want to be a, um, a flow-through entity or a C-Corp, the NOL rule needs to be addressed. And one of the other new areas here, which has quite a significant impact and is actually somewhat complex to, to state it mildly, is Section 163J. And this is the interest limitation, basically referred to as the 30% of adjusted taxable income rule. This is clearly something that will need to be modeled if for highly leveraged businesses when we anticipate um, limitations on the deductibility of this interest expense. It applies to see corporations and pass-throughs, so it's not a type of entity specific, and it's applied based on what is called a adjusted taxable income, which, as indicates up here, approximates earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Basically, and it, it's adjusted here for certain items of income, business income, or business interest income, if interest income is part of the trader business income, NOLs are factored into this. The deduction for 199 Cap A is not included in this for past two entities. And depre any depreciation or amortization that occurs before January of 2022 and other adjustments required by Treasury will have to wait for guidance on that whenever that occurs as necessary. One thing that is basically true here is any disallowed interest expenses indefinitely carried forward and can be used to offset future income from the trader business with some very special rules for flow-through entities. Specifically, for pass-through entities, the interest limitation applies at the partnership or S-corp level and is not reapplied at the shareholder level. There's kind of a special double-counting rule that prevents the use of flow-through income from offsetting other sources of interest expense at the shareholder or partner level. It can only be applied once for interest expense limitations at the entity level, not at the shareholder level. Another special rule applies for partnerships that basically says any disallowed interest expense is essentially attributed to the partner and is carried forward, and to the extent that there's excess business income above any interest expense at a future date, that amount can be utilized to offset any disallowed interest expense that is limited from that trader business from prior years. 
Uh, one of the exceptions out there, there's certain um, statutorily provided elections for real estate. Basically, when I say real estate, we're looking at uh, real estate trader, uh, real estate professionals, uh, farming businesses, certain regulated utilities. And there's an exemption, exemption for what they call floor plan financing, primarily specific to certain motor vehicles, boats, farming equipment, anything that's held by a dealer for sale or lease. One of the planning opportunities that was quickly identified is, especially in a partnership area, is could we convert to a type of equity unit such as a preferred interest in the partnership that is an equity interest that essentially equivalates to the debt, i.e., if you have an 8% debt, could you have a preferred interest that essentially pays an 8% preferred return on an annual basis? This is an, a question that is taken easily by turning, converting an interest that is otherwise in a standard creditor format that has certain rights as a creditor is a serious consideration. Once you move into the equity world, you're subordinate to all creditor claims and other certain state laws will need to be addressed. It's something that if you do move in to avoid the 30% rule as an equity interest, you're clearly taking on some additional potential risk. But it is a potential planning opportunity when there's anticipated to be significant limited um, interest expense limitations of the 30% rule. One other item that probably should be um, considered in addressing these uh, interest expense limitations is how long it's going to be out there. For example, in a partnership, how long is this interest expense going to be limited? For partnerships, the partners that don't utilize any unused interest expense can add it to their basis when they sell their partnership interest or they're redeemed and essentially reduce their gain or loss. But again, they're, re they're essentially trading off what would be normally an ordinary income deduction for a capital gain or loss item on the back end, what generally is a capital gain or loss item on the back end. Another um, interesting provision here, which is somewhat limited in application, and is generally limited to certain types of money managers, is the carried interest limitation. And it, it applies to what they call applicable partnership interests. And by definition, it is pretty much limited to those partners such as hedge fund operators, money managers, equity holders, private equity investors, that type of sophisticated investor takes what's carried, called a carried interest. The carried interest is such as just a profits interest in the entity that generally triggers on a liquidity event so that the partner gets a distributor share of the gain or loss on the disposition of the assets or gets a specified amount of equity purchase proceeds allocated to them to represent their what they call their carry portion. Generally, when I say profits interest, these members generally do not make capital contributions to the entity. Um, they um, generally just take profits interest. Profits interest defined as something that is, has no immediate liquidity value for which I, a partner makes no capital contributions, whether it's in the form of cash or in services or anything of that nature, and uh, does not receive a capital account return for that. If Capital contributions are made. Generally, those amounts are exempted from this quote-unquote three-year rule and holding period. But it is something that should be factored in when you're making your choice of entity determinations. What is a, should this, you know, we have private equity investments. Are you going to have pushbacks for different types of structuring? What's your intended hold date? Maybe three years is just fine. Um, sometimes it's not. I saw an interesting amendment come through on a partnership agreement here within the last day where the provision was, hey, we're going to, if we generally intend on holding our investments for three years, however, if we don't have 
the asset that we're holding for three years and have a liquidity of that, we're going to take qualified dividends to the extent we have them and specially allocate them to the carried, quote, unquote, identified managers, general partner, carried interest type holder to essentially work around this rule. Whether that will ultimately work or whether you actually have a source of qualified dividends is another question. It would probably work better in the hedge fund environment than you would typically see in a private equity fund where it may be you know, some of the investments or most of the investments are held through partnerships, also some through C-Corps, and you would be having to pick and choose and or make dividends out of qualified dividends out of certain C Corp entities. And there are a couple other exceptions. Partnership interest held by corporations are exempted. Uh, certainly and capital interest that are based on capital contributions. There will obviously be regulations and anti abuse rules here that will need to be addressed on these carried interest rules. And it really does apply to these quote unquote third party investors, as they refer to them, which are these hedge fund managers, private equity holders. And then I'll turn it over to Gunnar for our international changes. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, we're going to touch briefly on some of the, the international changes that were made to the U.S. tax code. We have, I think, oh, an entire webcast devoted to this um, earlier this week, and there's a lot of complexity in this area. But we're going to touch on specifically how you need to think about this if you're – in a situation in which you're a pass-through entity right now, an S corporation or a partnership, and you're thinking about converting to a C corporation, how you should think about the world, at least in, in broad terms, if you have international operations. And generally what I mean by that is you have boots on the ground, things happening in a foreign country. So most of the, what we're about to say probably doesn't apply just to persons who merely export things, but if you actually have operations in a foreign country and you're in a pass-through entity, what that means for you um, under these new provisions. And I think the general takeaway that we'd like to leave people with is that uh, these the international tax changes, they kind of leave pass-through entities in the lurch a little bit. Um, they, they, were, they were, broadly speaking, exposed to all the disadvantageous rules but do not get to participate in many, many of the new advantageous rules that were created um, in the international space. And so what are we talking about here in terms of at least the advantageous rules that pass-through entities uh, generally do not get to qualify um, for, at least to the extent that they, they don't have C-corporation partners, for instance. So we're talking about here, right, pass-through entities that have non-C-corporation owners with them. Uh, the first big one, and probably maybe the biggest, is that, uh, as you may be aware, the the Tax Cuts Act converted the U.S. effectively to a territorial system with respect to C-corporations. And what that means is that earnings that are earned by a C-corporation's foreign subsidiaries can now be distributed to the U.S. corporate parent of those subsidiaries without any U.S. tax being paid on that distribution from the foreign subsidiaries to the U.S. parent company. And that, that benefit is provided for the provided for by this new Section 245A that we have listed. That provision applies effectively only to C corporations. It does not apply to pass-through entities with, as again I said, individual owners. So they're entirely excluded from that great, fantastic territorial benefit. Um, that only applies to C corporations. Similarly, this Section 250, which is a new kind of deduction, special deduction um, provision, we won't get into the details of that, but that also uh, can be beneficial to a C corporation with international operations, but it only applies uh, to domestic corporations. And those domestic corporations, um, just because of the way the code kind of works out, generally do not include S corporations and partnerships that do not have C, corporate, C corporation owners. As I mentioned, although pass-through entities lose out, on, on these potential beneficial provisions, they are exposed to kind of the negative or disadvantageous provisions that are put in 
the code uh, with the Tax Act, and in particular, uh, as got a lot of press, this this deemed repatriation provision, or Section 965, in which you know these large U.S. multinationals are, are forced to pay tax on the earnings that they were holding offshore. I saw this morning that Apple, I think, is incurring a, a $38 billion charge on their foreign earnings. Um, pass-through entities are also exposed to this this provision. The owners of the pass-through entities uh, would have to potentially pay the tax on this. There's some beneficial rules for S corporations within 965, but nonetheless, uh, that that kind of toll charge on your foreign earnings applies in the pass-through context, even though I don't kind of get the upside of going into the the beneficial territorial provision. Um, the 951A, which is another kind of uh, anti-deferral rule. Um, again, also applies in the pass-through context, which is kind of a, a, a negative thing for pass-throughs because it might increase the speed at which I have to recognize um, earnings in any foreign subsidiaries uh, that the pass-through entity might have. And there are certain benefits with respect to that income that the pass-through entity does not receive. And so, again, pass-throughs are kind of put at a disadvantage under these provisions. The other thing that I'll note that's important that we mentioned earlier under Section 199A, 199A in the international context is that Section 199A, to have good qualified business income, that income must be effectively connected with the United States. So if you have international operations in which you're earning income, that income generally will not be considered effectively connected with the United States, and therefore none of that income can qualify for the 20% Section 199A deduction, potentially putting you at a significant disadvantage in a pass-through context as compared to what you could get in a C corporation with just the flat 21% rate applying to you. In certain cases, as I mentioned at the bottom, there's a number of these situations that can arise, and this is just one of them. You can see that the rate can get very, the rate differential can get, can get quite large because of the benefits that are bestowed upon C corporations that are not given to pass-through entities and in combination with the lack of the Section 199A benefit in the international context for pass-through entities. So um, something to keep your, mind, keep your eye on if you do have international operations and you're in a pass-through structure, um, you might want to give some consideration to, to thinking about how you might restructure your activities to take advantage of some of these rules. So that leads us to our, I guess, our fourth and final polling question. Um, this is just a true or false, uh, because S corporations are domestic corporations, quote unquote, S corporations can receive the benefit of the new dividends received deduction under Section 245A on dividends received from foreign subsidiaries, true or false. And, and kind of the key to understanding this rule, and I probably didn't do a great job explaining it in the prior slide, is that S corporations, although they're, they are domestic corporations in the, in the general sense, they compute their taxable income as if they were individuals, for the most part, with some exceptions. And so they don't generally compute their taxable income as if they were C corporations, and therefore uh, cannot take advantage of certain of these rules. And so we'll see where we came out, and it looks like uh, we did a fairly good job of explaining that, and so false, that is correct, 70% of you answered uh, correctly. S corporations cannot take advantage of that rule. So just some considerations. Um, we, we've kind of talked a lot about factors that should go into your modeling when you're deciding whether you should potentially become a C corporation, but the Act also includes um, some special rules for S corporations in the case in which they do decide to become C corporations. And there's two rules in particular that we'll touch on. But these rules, to, to apply these rules, that the S corporation must meet the definition of what is called an L terminated S corporation, which is kind of a mouthful, but it, it's kind of a relatively simple concept. And what it is, it's describing an S corporation, a corporation that was an S corporation on the date of the enactment uh, of the Tax Cuts, Cuts Act, and um, that chooses to revoke its S election within two years of the date of that enactment, and in which the owners are the same on the date of the enactment of the Tax Cuts Act and on the date that the S corporation election is revoked. So it's just kind of describing an S corporation that was around when this, all these changes happened. It's got the same ownership group in, in place and decides to revoke its election within two years uh, of the enactment of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. 
So what are the favorable rules that C corporations can receive, or excuse me, former S corporations can receive if they qualify for this benefit? The first is an extended Section 481A period. Section 481A generally um, deals with accounting method changes and potential um, income inclusions that must be recognized by taxpayers when they make an accounting method change. Often those income inclusions can be spread out over four years, but what this nice rule does for you is if you're an S corporation and you meet this definition um, as an eligible terminated S corporation, I, and the accounting method change is, is caused by my conversion to become a C corporation, I can spread that 481A period out over six years. And so it kind of allows me to defer the pain of the 481A adjustment caused by my C corporation conversion out over a longer time period. And so that, that can be a nice little uh, benefit for converting corporations. The second benefit that, that's thrown to these eligible uh, S corporations is a triple A rule. And this triple A rule, to understand this, you kind of got to know a little bit about the, the mechanics of triple A and what that's doing. Triple A is basically an account the S corporation maintains that measures its ability to dis make distributions to its shareholders without those shareholders recognizing dividend income. A C corporation doesn't generally have a triple A account. It keeps what we call earnings and profits, or E&P, and that E&P is effectively a measure of the corporation's dividend-paying capacity. So distributions to shareholders out of E&P are dividends to, to C corporation shareholders. What this rule does is it says, look, S corporation that converted to C corporation, we're going to let you keep track of that triple A balance that you had, that favorable um, accounting balance that you had. And going forward, when you pay a distribution to your shareholders after you become a C corporation, we're going to let you let you treat a portion of that distribution as from your triple A, i.e. as not a taxable dividend in the hands of your shareholders. And the, that portion of the dividend or that portion of the distribution, excuse me, that can be treated as, as out of triple A is going to be based on the ratio of that corporation's triple A versus the E&P that it will start tracking after it becomes a C corporation or that it had prior to becoming an S corporation. We'll note at the bottom here, though, is that although this is a nice rule and, and certainly lets you take advantage of your triple A as an S corporation that converts, there's likely better and more efficient ways to do that um, with a little bit of a tax planning on the front end. So although this is a nice little benefit, um, if you take a step back and think about ways that might be more efficient uh, uses of that triple A, there are probably easy planning um, steps that can be taken to, to take better advantage of your of your triple A as a former S corporation. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Jim for probably the most important part of this uh, program, uh, a few examples to walk through. Thanks, Gunnar. Uh, what we're going to do here for the remaining part of the uh, uh, presentation is kind of run through some very basic modeling exercises here and kind of compare a pass-through to a C-Corp and what the tax impact is. And in this example, we're going to start off kind of looking at the pass-through entity and assuming that it has business income 100 and it also has 109 cap A deduction and it's eligible to take the full 20% deduction, which for Chapter 1 purposes, and when I say Chapter 1 purposes, income tax purposes only, reduces taxable income that is used to compute income tax to $80 in this particular example. And based on that, the particular partner or shareholder of this particular entity or a group of them, whoever it may be, assuming all individuals and, and or trust, tax debt, maximum tax rates of 37% would pay tax on the $80 or $29.60. State income taxes, we're just assuming to be $5 here in this particular example. Again, 199 Cap A deduction is not eligible. Generally, we're assuming that the 199 Cap A is not available in the state that we're imposing a 5% income tax. Again, here, for com computation of all their self-employment income, if this is a partner, uh, or net investment income tax, if a passive partner or passive S-Corp shareholder um, would be based on the maximum $100 of business income here and no deduction for 199 Cap A. 
So the total tax that essentially would be paid would be $38.40 on $100 of income. And really the after-tax proceeds are about $61.60. Effective tax rates are approximately about 38.4%, and that includes a combination of Chapter 1 income tax and Chapter 2 net investment income tax or self-employment income. And if we move over to the C-Corp world, which this is a simplistic model, and we're also assuming that we're distributing out all of our income as a dividend. Clearly, the model would change and the results would change if income were to be retained for a period of time within the partner, within the C-Corp. Here, we're assuming corporate income of $100. We get a state income tax deduction of $5. No limitation on that. $95 taxable income, pay corporate income tax 21%. The after-tax cash in the corp is about $75. Dividend, basically, assuming everything is distributed, $75 is distributed, a shareholder will pay income tax, which includes a 20% federal income tax, 5% state tax, plus a 3.8% net investment income tax. There's no ifs, ands, or buts, or shall we say active shareholder exclusion from that being classified as net investment income. So the after-tax rate here is about 46.56%. Here you can see that um, rate's still relatively higher. However, that can be managed through a couple different ways. One is you don't have necessarily have to take that dividend in this year. Or two, we can look at it, what if we were to pay wages? And in this case, we just assume that 10% of the income is being distributed out reduced the overall corporate level income by the amount of wages paid and went through the same exercises. And also in this particular case, we have included a split of the payroll tax between the corporation and the individual and came up with an overall tax. Again, it reduces the overall corporate tax rate down to about 44%. And the reason being is you've basically pulled 10% of that income out and it's only taxed at one level. Again, this model could change quite a bit if we were to retain dividends in there and not assume that they're distributed out. However, that would make this example quite a bit more complex. And likewise, we would also assume there would be some sort of return on the retained cash within the C-Corp. So how does that change if we move into the environment where the pass-through is not eligible for a one and cap a 20% deduction? Well, we all of a sudden applying the same levels of income, same income tax rates. What do we come up with? Well, you notice these corporate tax rates are very corporate and flow through entity are very, very comparable. There is no significant difference between the two. They've essentially closed the gap. Mind you, before you move into the C Corp world, there's a lot of potential issues that need to be addressed. Uh, especially if this were to be a service entity and you may be able to pay out all the income at one wage level at the C-Corp level and just pay income tax on that C-Corp level as wages. In this situation, if we, the only other things you may want to consider is there advantages to being a pass-through entity? Can we give flexibility? Can we issue uh, profits, interests, we want the flexibility to doing something like that, special allocations. All these items need to be factored in, and that's why this needs to be considered and modeled. Now, do you have partners that want preferred returns, special types of preferred returns? Um, and uh, those things are generally going to be much more difficult to equivalent on a C-Corp uh, equity investment. And in the world where if there was a situation which is a little less rare where there's no self-employment income in the distributive share or net investment income, how does that impact us? Well, we're still at a, and assuming there's no 199 cap A benefit, those tax rates, again, are still relatively close. And again, I think what we need to consider here is, and why this individual is not subject to self-employment tax um, and not net investment income tax kind of in the sweet spot or as a real estate professional, et cetera. And, but as we generally 
consider if you're in the real estate world, you may not want to be in the corporate structure and pay a double taxation and or consider other items that, of flexibility that are needed for real estate investments. So I think the takeaway that we want to really say from this entity, and before we turn this open for questions here for the remaining few minutes of this presentation, is to have you just look back at your exam and a, a very detailed list, not only of modeling, but basically all the facts and circumstances, understanding your trader business, and all the considerations that are inherent with either being a partnership or with a corp, and saying, what should I choose? How should I choose it? Before any decisions are made to incorporate, and I would recommend a review with both your attorneys, your tax advisors, whoever else you may be involved in that are general business advisors before a decision is made. And likewise, one other thing that we should probably keep in mind is a lot of these rules that Gunnar and I discussed have implications that require regulations and other guidance from Treasury. We are probably at a year out, would be my guess, on a lot of these regulations. Um, maybe there's some guidance that will come out in the interim over the summer, or in the fall of next year, but I would generally think a lot of this will require significant um, drafting from the service. They're going to have to issue proposed regulations, get feedback from the tax community and from the general public and businesses, and then constantly fine-tune these regulations, which have, could have significant impact on taxable income. With that, I'm going to, on the remaining few minutes, I'm going to open it up for questions. So, Jim, I've got a, a kind of, a, I think, a good question, an enlightening, or a good example um, sure. from one of uh, the attendees, who had, which um, I think kind of helps illustrate some, some probably common uh, potential problems in our thinking about Section 199A and also illustrates maybe some planning that can be done in the 199A area. But the, the gist of the question is that we have an S corporation, let's say it earns taxable income uh, of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And within that a million dollars, let's just say it has one owner. And within that one million dollars is a $500,000 deduction that the S corporation has taken for W-2 wages paid to the S corporation shareholder. And the question okay. um, is, can I include those uh, W-2 wages in my qualified business income? And I think the answer to that is no. You cannot include mm -hmm. those W-2 wages uh, in the qualified business income because uh, they're compensation. And so they do, right. not, they do not qualify. You're kind of limited to the, the remaining $1 million um, that's in the S corporation. But, but I, wanted, I, I thought this was an interesting example because I think it, 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 it highlights that there is some tension. You might, you might take that and say, well, geez, I should reduce my, my wages to my owner to the maximum extent that I possibly can because I want to have more quality right. business income. And that's true, I think, to the extent uh -huh. you can manage your – your W-2 qualified property limitation. But the thing you have to keep in mind is that although the W-2 wages paid to the owner are unhelpful for purposes of having qualified business income, they are helpful for purposes of the W-2 limitation. So there's kind of a math exercise that you have to go through there to see uh, what's my problem. Is my problem 20% of right. qualified business income or is the W-2 wages limitation? And you kind of got to figure out where's my optimal compensation to be paid out and how, yeah, and how much of uh, how much you could reduce those w-2 wages if it w is beneficial without running afoul of the reasonable comp rules for an s-corp shareholder so so i think with that we're running out of time and then we'll hand it back over to emily to wrap us up awesome thank you gunner and thank you jim for a great presentation today uh, we certainly covered a lot of material and while we didn't have time to address all of the questions that came in, uh, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. And you may also reach out directly to Jim or Gunnar if you would like. And as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group 
and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you'll join us again next time.